this is a diagram showing how stars evolved. So all stars started in the, in the early universe as a cloud of gas. Okay? So you start with some sort of big, enormous cloud of gas. Gravity acts on that cloud and eventually pulls it together and it congeals into a solid object. If it's not very heavy, it will stop here and just become what, what's known as a brown dwarf. A brown dwarf is basically a, something between a planet like Jupiter and a, and a, a star like our sun. It's either, depending on how you look at it, a very small star or a very large planet. But they're very faint, so that's one possibility. If it's bigger, this cloud of gas, and it collapses into a heavier object, it becomes a hydrogen burning, burning star. And then, depending on how big it is, it takes a, a range of trajectories. In the case of our, su our sun, it goes along this trajectory. It eventually runs out of hydrogen and starts burning helium. And then it grows. It grows into a red giant. So when it's done being a red giant, it'll run out of helium and it'll become something of what called a white dwarf. A white dwarf is essentially a bunch of hot white holes. It's not burning fuel anymore. It's not like a star where it's doing nuclear, nuclear fusion and then making, making heat. But it's so hot that it just glows white. And eventually, after many, many billions of years, it becomes a, a black dwarf when it cools off. And all that stuff that it spewed off that you were talking about when it was a red giant becomes a new cloud of, cloud of gas that eventually could lead to new stars, so it kind of recycles. So it's much more interesting what happens to a star along this trajectory. So our, our star is comparatively boring compared to if it were, say, twice as big as it is. If it were twice as big, then it would become a, a, a much a different class of star, a very massive star, burning hydrogen, helium, and other heavier elements, all the way up to iron. <coughs> and eventually, when it runs out of these things, these big stars explode. They become supernova explosions. And when they do, they become one of two things, either a neutron star or a black hole. Does anybody know what a neutron star is? So the whole thing is, consists of neutrons. Right? So everything in this room is made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? The whole, the whole periodic table is. You and I have never seen anything made of only neutrons. It doesn't exist under normal conditions. But under these very special conditions, after left behind after a, after a supernova explosion, you can get this all neutron matter. Um, I used to know what it was, but there's something like, you could, if you picked up, you could hold in your hand the size of, of neutron matter this big, it would weigh something like, 10,000 times out of the Empire State Building, or something ridiculous one like that. One teaspoon is 290 tons. There we go. One teaspoon is 290 tons. So even weirder is that there are supernovae, if the, if the star is even bigger, something like eight times the size of our sun, it becomes a black hole. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. Or now. <laughs> so if you take a baseball and throw it straight up, eventually it's going to come back down to Earth, right? But we all know that there is ultimately an escape velocity that if you, if you can throw it fast enough, it would, eventually, it would leave the Earth's gravitational pull and go off to infinity. The same thing is true with light. <laughs> light has a speed. It has what, a specific speed, unlike baseballs. Baseballs can come at different speeds. Um, light comes with one. And that if, if you make the gravity so strong that anything leaving the surface of that object with a given speed, with, with the speed of light, comes back then you have a black hole, and no light can ever escape from it. Okay. Okay. So black holes are surrounded by this, this point in space, this surface in space is called the event horizon. It's also called the sort child radius. And anything that ever enters the, this, this event horizon can never, ever, ever come back. So it really is, it's a, it, it, a causal discontinuity. Why, is, why can't it ever come back? Well, look, let, me, let me see if I can explain, and if I don't, just stop me. So one way of looking at it is once it's inside this, it, could, it would take an infinite amount of energy to get out of here. Okay. Another way of looking at it is that gravity becomes so strong in the presence of a black hole that you actually have space and time distorted so much that it becomes an infinite trip to cross that line. You could either think of it as taking an infinite amount of time or an, or an infinite amount of distance to cross. Um, just wait. Okay. 
So this is kind of a space-time diagram of the vicinity of around a black hole. So think of this, this is the middle of the black hole. This is outside somewhere, and around here is a Schwarzschild radius. And because this point gets stretched from here to infinitely far down, it becomes an infinite distance from the middle of the black hole to the Schwarzschild radius. So this is actually how we see black holes in the world. This is, a, again, a, a, a computer simulation. This is some sort of giant star, and that's the black hole. And it's gradually sucking matter, or accreting matter, from the star onto it. And it's creating this thing known as an accretion disk. And this is actually what we see black holes to look like in the universe. Uh, I have another... It's spewing matter up in this jet, and that's the brightest thing we see. Go ahead. I have another question. How come in space everything seems to rotate in a nice disk? Um, that's just kind of a natural um, state of affairs, actually. I mean, you can in this. So, like when our solar system formed, for example, I'll play this again while we do. Um, when our solar system formed, there was a bunch of random debris, right? And then you know it naturally has some sort of angular momentum, and then you start spinning anything up like this and give it some friction naturally everything forms a disk. That's just kind of the, the, the natural state of affairs. It's, it's a matter of friction and rotation. So here's how, you, in a cartoon, how you actually look for machos. They're invisible, so they're really hard to find, or almost invisible. But you can use something called gravitational lensing to look for these sorts of things. So imagine you have some distant object, some star or galaxy, and between you and it, you have an invisible macho. A, a black hole, say, or a neutron star, or whatever. Gravity will cause the beams of light from this object to be bent. And what you actually see is a lensing effect. So this thing actually focuses the light from the distant object. And when that macho gets in the middle, it suddenly gets brighter. And so you can look at pieces of the sky and look for stars that suddenly get brighter, or galaxies that suddenly get brighter. And then you can point a telescope at that part of the sky hopefully find the macho. Here's an example of such a thing. So this is the same piece of the sky observed by the same experiment at two different times. And notice this little bright, slightly bright um, piece of the sky. And it's, it's missing there. It's fainter there. So what happened is, at this point, the macho wasn't yet completely focusing the light. And here it was. And now this is a better picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of the same frame. And what they see is something that's actually uh, a black hole of about six times the, the sun's mass along that line of sight. All right, so after all this talk of machos, we can all conclude that machos make up the dark matter of our universe, right? No. In fact, these searches for a gravitational lensing event have found a number of machos, but not nearly enough to constitute all the dark matter. In fact, it's, it's less than 20% of the dark matter, probably much less, is, is machos. Most of it's something else. 